organized by the Department of History, the IQSC of Vinasanko College Pishra. Uh, so, this is located in Ubi, West Bengal, uh, India. Uh, we are affiliated under the University of uh, Calcutta. Uh, so, uh, welcome to today's webinar on the history of India's foreign relations with new normal times. Uh, its destiny has India lost uh, her foreign policy. So, today uh, we have got as our distinguished uh, guests, uh, we have got uh, uh, Dr. Sudip Roy. Uh, he is the MLA uh, uh, of Sirampur constituency and he is also the president of the governing body uh, of Vidhan uh, Chandra College, uh, Rishwa. Uh, then we have got our vice principal, Dr. Ramesh Paul. Uh, we have got as keynote speaker, Professor uh, Shivashish uh, Chatterjee. He is the professor of the uh, Department of International Relations, uh, Jadavpur University, West Bengal. Uh, we have Professor Shah uh, Pradhan. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. is the Associate Professor of Department of International Relations, uh, University of Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh. So, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Shuripta Roy, uh, uh, sir, is uh, unable to attend uh, to this program due to some busy uh, schedule uh, of his. So, we will start with uh, our Vice Principal, uh, Dr. Ramesh Kaur. Uh, I will request uh, sir to formally welcome you all. Uh, so, uh, we will give the welcome address. So, now, uh, sir, it's uh, over to you. You can uh, deliver your uh, welcome address. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Respected President of the Governing Body, respected distinguished research person, honorable dignitaries, dear colleague, research scholar, beloved. Convener, Joint Convener, Program Advisor, Coordinator, Joint Coordinator, and Excellent Student. It is a real pleasure and privilege to be present with the International Webinar organized by Department of History in collaboration with IQAC. Being the head of the institute, I must congratulate the teachers of the Department of History, especially Dr. Swamin Raman Bishas, who has taken the initiative to organize the international webinar. First of all, I, on behalf of the Institute, must welcome the respective research person of Professor Shivasis Chatterjee, Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University. Dr. Ruprasad Pradhan, Associate, Associate Professor, Department of Social Science, Builder Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani Goa. Professor Sarah Hilal, Hilali, Department of Rajiv Gandhi University, Arunachal Pradesh. Professor Dilwar Hosan, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Sujit Dokto, Associate Professor, Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. I would be immensely grateful as they have responded to our invitation despite their busy schedule. I convey my best wishes to our governing body members for moral support to organize the international webinar. I do hope that our participants would reap a sound harvest from the day's discussion. I, I firmly believe that the day's discussion will be interesting and interactive one. The survey of the day's speech and reciprocal discussion, I do hope, would further illumine the minds of the teachers and thought. I wish a warm success of the day's webinar. Once again, thanking you all. Namaskar. We'll move on to the uh, uh, move on to our keynote speaker. Uh, I will uh, request uh, Professor uh, Sribashish uh, Chatterjee, is the professor of Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University, to deliver the keynote address of today's uh, program. Uh, so, sir, uh, can you sir can you hear me? Hello. Uh, 
Shubhashi sir, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear yeah. you absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, so uh, now uh, you can deliver your keynote address. So it's uh, over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, I take this opportunity to extend my uh, you know, warm thanks to the Department of History of uh, of, of this institution who in fact have you know uh, had this seminar in mind the webinar rather in mind and you know invited me to deliver uh, the keynote address let me at the outset say that look you know i'm not really sort of delivering a very formal you know keynote address which uh, uh, in fact requires a lot of time and i don't wish to extend this uh, to uh, any uh, anything more than 15 to 20 minutes i've already promised let's say and I'm also not uh, going to either, in a way, let's say, you know, empirically narrate uh, the concatenation of Indian foreign policy over the long period, starting uh, historically, let's say, you know, from uh, the Nehruvian times to the present era. Nor am I, in a sense, let's say, highlighting what really are very major, you know, tasks and issues which bedevil uh, our foreign policy right at the outset. So what I have in, instead, uh, you know, uh, decided to do is very broadly speak on uh, five sets of issues, which in fact would possibly cover 15 to 20 minutes of time that I claim for myself. My first uh, argument that I make, in fact, is that, uh, that the fundamental element uh, in Indian foreign policy uh, is the quest for recognition. And this quest for recognition, in fact, is the central narrative, which in fact is far more critical and, and important than the other two, uh, I would say, objectives that are often uh, touted as essential, uh, being uh, security on one hand and economic well-being on the other. So my first argument, in fact, is that both security and, and economic well-being, these are largely sort of predicated on India's claim to recognition, which in fact is the historical I would say, you know, an existential precondition, let's say, of India's foreign policy. Now, what is significant and critical is that this notion of recognition, in fact, had gradually evolved in Indian foreign policy. And my first point, in fact, is to share uh, what exactly is the nature of this evolution that we have. In a nutshell, uh, even the fact that, you know, we have paucity of time and I'm not going to extend this, what we have seen over the years is a gradual, let's say, transition from a form of recognition which could be described as politics of universalism to another form of recognition which is largely in the nature of politics of difference. Now, what this basically sort of amounts to is this, that if you look at the notion of recognition closely, whether you are looking at the individual, I would say, driver of recognition or a more collective driver of recognition, which happens to be the case here, because we're looking at uh, India as a nation state. But while the, uh, the nature of the actor, in fact, is different, but the conceptual, you know, I would say, brass tacks of recognition, in fact, doesn't change if you shift the levels of analysis. In simple terms, what I wish to say is this, that whether you are looking at an individual as a basis of recognition, or you are looking at a state as a basis of recognition, the conceptual moorings, in fact, will not change. They, in fact, you know, would largely remain the same. So with this in mind, what I intend to tell you is this, that the earlier notion of recognition, in fact, was a modern notion of recognition where there was a gradual distinction, let's say, from a notion of recognition based on honor, which in fact is much more hierarchical in nature, which makes a distinction, let's say, between the, uh, the, the honor, you know, claiming agent on the one hand and the honor recognizing agents on the other. We, in fact, have gradually moved into a more modern notion, let's say, of recognition, which was based on equal respect on one hand and a form of uh, autonomy, you know, as self-realization on the other. So, in a sense, this shift, in fact, is largely, you know, was a shift from the more Hegelian, you know, to a more Kantian idea, let's say, recognition. And one finds this amply demonstrated in the way in which Nehru, in fact, had, you know, uh, thought about India's role in world affairs, which was not only based on recognition, but was also largely based on a progressive notion where the idea, in fact, was 
that you know the vision that india in fact would have of the world would be larger than india itself okay so it would be a progressive you know notion which in fact would not be narrowly limited to the parochial claims of india's you know uh, i would say you know national interests but the very notion of the national interest in fact would be a far more enlightened and progressive national interest which in fact would be in line with the progressive you know and you know i would say imagination of the world now over the years what we have witnessed in fact is that gradually from this autonomy centric idea let's say of recognition indian foreign policy had gradually sort of shifted and it's shifting towards what would be called again a kind of rever- you know revering back to more on a centric notion let's say of recognition where india seems to be more and more conscious of its power claims and while uh, the power claim in fact is uh, a, a reflex of uh, by large let's say you know the materiality of india uh, but then it's also in a sense uh, a reflection of the fact that it's uh, a move towards a more hierarchical let's say sort of notion where uh, there is a recognition of a hierarchy which means that there is a recognition of differences in terms of power but there is a claim that india in fact must be recognized its legitimate place in the pantheon of nations you know which means that it's an endorsement of the hierarchy but at the same time it's also a claim that india occupies a position which is high up on the hierarchy now the second uh, argument that i put forward you know to you is that if you are a, you know, if you are studying indian foreign policy then it's very clear to us that indian foreign policy in fact happens in two i would say simultaneous but inextricably intertwined registers one of the register of indian foreign policy in fact is power which is very well known and the other in fact is normativity or norms and i would end up talking uh, you know a bit more on norms and possibly would not really have much time you know to talk on power and i hope that the others in fact you know basically sort of then papers would touch upon the elements of power more closely so coming to norms the argument that i put forward is this that look in a sense to understand indian foreign policy in fact is to come to terms of the foreign policy identity that india in fact had posited and india in fact had articulated over a period of time how do we make sense of this foreign policy identity now uh, very largely there are three i would say you know uh, possible explanations of this foreign policy identity that you find in the literature that exists amongst many and again given the time constraint that we have that i'm not going to take you through all the you know possible let's say sort of imaginations that we uh, you know have <laughs> to come by but these three in fact are so critically important and they are conceptually so very rich that it really begs some some you know some of our time and attention in order to come to terms with them so the first notion of identity that we have in fact is the notion of victim which is basically a kind of an identity which monjuri miller and you know based you know our articulates in the form of an idea which says that look india and also a country like china they in fact have always thought of themselves as victims of colonialism and that scar of colonialism in fact had somehow remained in their you know post colonial side so therefore even if you are looking at post colonial foreign policy the distinction between the colonial and the post colonial in fact is something which is very difficult really to completely completely overcome you know in cases of countries like india on one hand and china on the other one aspect of this uh, you know notion of victim of impact is tremendous sensitivity to claims of sovereignty and territorial nationalism in the simplest of terms it basically means that these countries in fact they show extraordinary sensitivity to claims of territoriality and claims of sovereignty and any possible move i repeat any possible move in fact which seems to be a dilution of these notions of territoriality and sovereignty in fact would be resisted and would be critiqued by powers like india and powers like china so if you look in closely to india this in fact is a one possible foreign policy identity which in fact is there the second foreign policy identity that one comes across in fact is found in uh, writings of scholars like estrada salivan and others who broadly says that look the 
principal idea of Indian foreign policy, in fact, you know, is in the concept of its civilizational heritage. Now, civilizational heritage, in fact, is such an interesting concept, and it has many, again, sort of, you know, interesting permutations and combinations, many variations on the theme. One of the critical, you know, I would say, element here, in fact, is, as I, as I said, is what Sullivan says, you know, who, you know whose, whose point is that, look, there are these two aspects to India's, you know, claim to identity. One, it's claim that it has always been a power which is different from others, and its notion of difference comes and its notion of difference comes from what its notion of difference comes from. It's from what is called, you know, uh, peaceful coexistence, which separates from powers in the past, who in fact had not really been thoughtful of others. But India, in fact, is thoughtful of others and it's committed to the idea of peaceful coexistence. The second aspect, you know, which uh, is, you know, which Sullivan talks about is that India's claim civilization and civilizational heritage also you know builds on its pluralism you know its its capacity to live in a diverse society its capacity for dialogue its capacity for negotiation its capacity in fact you know uh, in, in a sense to, to balance claims of difference of one hand and claims of gener and generality on the other something in fact which again you know makes India so very different from great many other you know, I would say nations of the world. I mean, the claim is not that India, in fact, is the sole civilizational you know, state. That's not the claim. But the claim is that there is distinctiveness in this claim. And this distinctiveness, in fact, is the legacy of uh, not only having a great civilization of the past, but also by virtue of the fact that our civilization, in fact, have been, uh, you know, committed to peaceful coexistence and been in largely a different society. Um, even to sort of negotiate differences between uh, Cohen, in fact, you know, has a slightly different notion, let's say, of his civilization heritage uh, in his own writings, where he has largely sort of made the argument that India's claim to civilization is much more historical, you know, uh, which sort of builds on the past of one hand and the Muslim heritage, which till very recent times, in fact, have been an inextricable part of our national history. And so therefore, when, you know, whether you were looking at Ashoka, or you were looking at a or you were looking at Akbar, all these in fact have conquered, all these things in fact have conquered this great civilization heritage. And accordingly, in fact, you know, India can be claim uh, to a voice and to a role. There's very few states in fact. Finally, the third idea of identity which we have, you know, on the is also right, so it is, it is important, is a new identity. Which is basically sort of based on, you know, uh, cultural nationalism. Now, cultural nationalism is a uh, controversial idea. Now, I'm not going to be able to give you the details of this imagination right now. But this is an imagination which thrives on difference, broadly sort of makes the claim that unless India, in fact, is able to culturally salvage itself, and the salvaging aspect of its culture, in fact, would have to be, in a way, mired in a Hindu imagination of its cultural ethos, it would never be able to realize the potential to power which in fact predicates on its exclusive cultural heritage. In other words, in the simplest of terms, the argument here is this, that we need to, you know, discipline ourselves in a manner so that the diversity in fact doesn't really become a source of weakness, which the argument goes in fact had been in the past. So we need to be robust, we need to be, you know, sanitized enough and the sanitized, robust form, in fact, can only come from a certain commitment to a strong form of cultural nationalism, in fact, which would, in a way, you know, invest in, uh, in, in a form of power, which India, in fact, had not had in the past. The third point, which I uh, wish to sort of share, you know, in, in, in front of you, is the fact that, look, a great amount of continuity to Indian foreign policy, in fact, can be read in what is known as the concept of uh, what would be called positive autonomy. So what is this positive autonomy that one is talking about? This positive, positive autonomy, in fact, uh, historically we call a certain principle non-alignment or it would be called a kind of nexus strategic autonomy, which in fact have been touted you know, in more recent terms. But all, what all these in fact amount to is a kind of a shift, let's say, in Indian foreign policy, you know, from one kind of freedom uh, which was based more on uh, a negative understanding of freedom 
to a more positive understanding of freedom through the ETs of foreign policy. I'll very briefly tell you what exactly that is. So if you look closely to the Cold War understanding of foreign policy that we have, or the more, uh, I would say, paradigmatic Nehruvian understanding of foreign policy that we in fact have, and which we continue for a very long period of time, and in many ways, till our, you know, nuggets of foreign policy, in fact, you know, would largely be, you know, in, 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 in many ways, let's say, Nehruvian. So, if you look closely, the Cold War understanding of that imagination was that India needed to maintain a principal distance, let's say, you know, from the two poles of power. So, the measure of autonomy, in fact, the value of autonomy, the measure of our distance, let's say, from these two distinctive poles of power. Now, in the post-Cold War, in the fact that the two have one pole of power, okay, and I'm not really going into the right of China, and whether that really sort of, the argument in fact goes that it makes very little sense to make the argument that you can really have a kind of a measure, let's say, distance from a pole of power, which is the sole pole of power. And the criticality of the argument is that the measurement of freedom in fact doesn't actually lie in the distance that you have. Rather, you need to have a calibration of freedom by closely looking at whether you were able to realize your claims of autonomy to purposive meaningful foreign policy action or not. So if realization demands proximity to power, then that associational proximity in fact is what you need to do. So that doesn't detract from freedom, that actually adds to it, that actually best, that makes it freer. So that's basically a positive idea of, uh, of, of freedom, which is a sense of positive autonomy, which in fact is new. In fact, it is a departure from the more negative orientation that India's foreign policy in fact have had in the past. The fourth point which I place before you, in fact, is that one of the major, you know, uh, consistent pillars of Indian foreign policy, in fact, had been a certain idea or a certain notion of multilateralism that, in fact, had always been there in Indian foreign policy. This broadly means what? This broadly means that India, in fact, had always been conscious, let's say, of its uh, of its responsibilities beyond its shores, okay, which means that, you know, India had always embraced the notion of national interest, which is not parochial, which is not limited only to claims of power that you could, you know, reach only to the geographical, territorial ambit of India. But in a sense, it's a, it's a balance, let's say, between our, uh, you know, claims of, uh, you know, national, you know, interest on one hand, and the more... Uh, you know, I would say a, a more universalistic cosmopol cosmopolitan attachments, you know, on the other. So it's a balance between, in the simplest of terms, nationalism on one hand and cosmopolitanism on the other. So if you were looking at India's multilateralism, there are two aspects to India's multilateralism and it's very difficult to generalize them. One aspect to India's multilateralism, historically in fact, is that it's a form of multilateralism which in fact is best described as a form of non-domination, as a, a, you know, as a date to justice, which basically means what? Which basically means that India in fact had been extremely cautious of the claim that nations in fact must be protected against all kinds of, you know, uh, arbitrary interferences and, you know, great power, you know, what would be called great, great power interferences, let's say, which in fact makes what? Which makes, uh, you know, uh, Realizing a, a, a nation's foreign policy objectives is very, very difficult. So non-domination basically means that every state, in fact, has a scripted, you know, what we call potential. And non-domination here simply means that it is by uh, balancing your dreams, or, you know, of, of national interest with your cosmopolitan responsibilities that you were able to realize that scripted, you know, what you call potential that you have. And you need multilateral institutions so that you were able to do that. The second aspect of multilateralism, in fact, is this, that India's multilateralism is also a commitment to justice, which is sensitive to the claims of difference. Why this is important is because that if you look at the architecture of, of the world order that we run, regardless of the kind of you know, uh, crisis that we, in fact, are encountering, and my argument, in fact, is that if we look closely, that we are still very much in the throes of, or in the cusp of, the inherited international order that we are running despite the crisis that we are currently facing. So if you look closely to that inherited, uh, you know, international order which we run, it's by and large a Western order. 
it's by and large an order which in fact you know, uh, you know, you know which, which, is, which is based on commitments to certain Western principles. India's you know, position you know, had always been that on the one hand she remains committed to you know, largely to a set of you know, ideas which could be you know, in a sense argued as or described as you know, uh, liberal you know, I would say ideas but on the other hand India is exclusively I would say sensitive very, very sensitive to its claim of difference, broadly making the argument that countries which are made civilizational states like India, in fact, they will always have problems in uh, finding, you know, what would be called proper roles or fitting roles, you know, within this Western architecture. And where there is a kind of clash between the, uh, the aspirational roles of India one on one hand, and the kind of tasks that India, in fact, would have to implement through the existing institutions of uh, the international order on the other. The only guarantee that India seeks, in fact, is the guarantee of difference. In other words, there must be significant space within the multilateral order where the specificity of India and states like India, in fact, which can only be expressed through the language of difference, in fact, you know, uh, is properly and legitimately active. And absolutely, finally, my final argument, in fact, is that, you know, India, in fact, has gradually, you know, moved from being what I call a non-conformist to an increasingly conformist, you know, major power. Now, what is essentially meant by this is that, look, you know, you have to emphasize and you have to understand both the materiality of power on one hand and the normative prerequisites of uh, a responsible power. Okay on the other, you know, which means that the materiality of power is very well understood and there has not been a major revolution there, you know, in the sense that India has sort of largely remained committed to uh, the uh, conventional, let's say, you know, models of political economy and largely remained committed to democracy. But on the other hand, if you look closely, where the shift in fact, you know, has taken place is that India in fact has become far more, I would say, accepting of the many responsibilities that the world order in fact trusts upon them as India's material power in fact has grown. So in the past, India's claim to greatness, India's foreign policy voice in fact was more of a voice, let's say, of a power which wasn't really a materially, you know, I would say significant state, but it was making all kinds of claims on the basis of its moral notions of difference. But now, increasingly, in fact, what you have is this more, you know, I would say, uh, well-calibrated balance between materiality on one hand which sort of is predicated on India's economic growth uh, largely and India's increasing military prowess. And on the other hand, the moral responsibilities or the normative responsibilities, you know, or, you know, that the new international order, in fact, poses on a state like India on the other. So therefore you find what, so therefore you find that India exercises those responsibilities to self-restraint. Okay, I mean, so again the argument is that India, in fact, is a major power, it's a rising power, but, you know, we could not be a rising power which, in fact, would uh, take others to task. We would not be a new colonial power, okay? So, it would be a trusting power. It would be, in fact, in many ways, a power which would be innately democratic in nature. But the fact is what? But the fact is that, you know, on the other hand, it would also be a case, you know, where you would find what? It's also be a case where you will find that India is committed to our uh, you know, the like power for example, the provision of Kalim 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 is far more accepting, and this is where the conformist part comes in, far more accepting rather than revolting of the existing norms, let's say, of the global order, you know, and whether these norms in fact are part of the, you know, uh, of a large, let's say, you know, a liberal political economy, whether these part into emphasizing the democratic nature of the world system, or they part into a problematic aspect, you know, which had been in the past in Indian foreign policy, like proliferation of goals and proliferation of goals. But in all these major issues, that there is a shift, you know, that the India that we used to have in the past, which in fact was an India,
this in fact was much more of a, I would say, so on alias kind of a power. You know, always trying to, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, try, trying to, trying to, let's say, you know, make a dream for an alternative world order. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a world order, in fact, which would be predicated on, on, on an alternative to a power, which is much more acceptable to order. And therefore, much more in comfort, let's say, you know, with the, uh, with the architecture, whether you understand that architecture in terms of the more regular distribution of power or in terms of the institutional dynamic that you have. This so is the script through which I read this And this is a script which is as much uh, a description of continuity as much of Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for this uh, wonderful uh, address. Uh, uh, sir, uh, once again, thank you for this. Uh, if uh, the participants have any questions uh, regarding this, we will come back uh, in the end. Uh, so next, uh, we'll move on to the uh, next uh, session of ours, uh, where we'll have the panel uh, discussion, and uh, that discussion will be chaired by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, this is the uh, Pradhan uh, and he and will be also there as a speaker. So, uh, and in that panel discussion, we will have Professor Sara Hilali. Uh, she is the Professor of Department of History, uh, Rajiv Gandhi University, uh, Rono Il uh, Boimu, Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, then we will have Professor Dilwar Hussain. Uh, he is the Professor of Department of International Relations, uh, University of Dhaka. Bangladesh and we will have another distinguished speaker from Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Sujit Dotto, he is the Associate Professor of Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh. So now uh, I will request uh, Dr. Rudra Prasad Pradhan to now I will hand over the virtual microphone to you and uh, you can start this uh, panel. This. Uh, thank you everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, everybody. It is a wonderful uh, beginning, I think, uh, the keynote speaker. A number of questions, of course, I have to you, sir. Um, uh, but at the end of it, we will uh, talk about it. Uh, now, uh, I'm connecting from Goa, from Bits Milani, Goa campus. And the mandate for me is to uh, chair the session and uh, capture also the history of India's foreign relations in new normal. And there is also a kind of a, you know, a statement, a statement that uh, has India lost our foreign policy. So these are all two uh, separate uh, you know, themes uh, together. So I'm trying to capture both of them and uh, you know, present my views. Then I'll invite my fellow you know, panelists also to speak on their uh, areas of uh, you know, thought. Now, uh, from the normative uh, proposition that uh, Dr. Chatterjee talked about, I'm moving to the experimental, the world reality you know, aspect of how the foreign policy has been executed from the Indian side itself and how have we looked at the world ourselves and how has the world looked at us from their perspective also. And I'm trying to create a synergy between what has happened at the experimental level, at the ground level. Now, when we talk of uh, you know, foreign policy, today in particularly world order, and all of us, we are uh, familiar that we are in a great uh, transition time and uh, the transition can be captured in two ways. One, that's uh, Graham Allison's Thucydides trap that proposes that uh, the rise of a new power in the town would invariably you know, encourage a situation where the old powers will resist and there is a physical fight and war that we are uh, facing today. And well, India can well be one of the front of Thucydides trap. The second aspect, uh, I would say, Gramalism was a realist, is a realist. But convergence is interpreted in multiple ways. And Amita Bacharya, he talks about a phenomena called multiplex world order. Kisor Mebubani, uh, the Singapore uh, diplomat of uh, Lee Kuan Yi Institute of Public Policy, he wrote the first book uh, called The Great Convergence, where he says that world is witnessing far less number of wars, quality of life has improved, People are converging more into many, many things. But the economists and the sociologists, they have uh, different uh, interpretation of the convergence that we see uh, today. Uh, 
Richard Baldwin. Richard Baldwin is currently teaching at uh, Geneva School of Economics and he wrote his book in 2016 called The Great Convergence. He looks at the, the convergence idea from the economic point of view where he says that from 1990s the world order critically, critically moved from what you call the manufacturing economy to the idea economy or the knowledge economy and what the knowledge economy did is that that uh, the manufacturing economy particularly he mentions was a time frame of uh, great divergence that few countries in the world had the technology of manufacturing and so they became uh, super rich rest of the world remained poor and that's where he called the phenomena uh, of uh, great divergence because it created polarity of wealth and rest of the world remained uh, you know less uh, rich 90s onwards or early 80s onwards what has happened is that uh, you know the capital uh, uh, the north american capital and the european capital is meeting the chinese labor indonesian labor and indian, indian labor or, or philippines labor or mexican labor and they are creating productivity and what has what it has created is a very serious critical uh, change in the in the world order that's it uh, de-industrialized north america and europe it critically industrialized China that we see today is the industrial depth of China that is what is creating the Thucydides strap uh, phenomena. It is happening because of the, the dynamic change of mode of production, Marxian mode of, mode of production that changed. That's what has shifted the world order. And suddenly, many countries in the world they became, became economically poor at the cost of the Americans, at the cost of the Europeans, and all that. And we are more and more moving towards it. Towards a you know, multipolarity framework, and I think uh, Professor Chatterjee also uh, captured it very well. So we stand at this moment as we are talking. We stand at this uh, uh, great uh, you know, uh, crossroads of Thucydides' trap and great convergence. Now, where does India's foreign policy negotiate itself? You know, historically and uh, till now, or how are we looking forward? the future times as we are uh, debating on this. I would uh, like to capture it since it is uh, history of India's foreign policy till uh, your normal. I would capture the India's foreign policy till today in six phases. One is that uh, I'm trying to capture both the sociologists, the economists, the political scientists and all of them together to look at a world order and its transition that is happening and where is India positioning itself in the whole whole uh, narrative from the beginning till today. So I divide the, the, the class, uh, they categorize the whole spectrum into six phases. First, if we look at it, you know, from the day one or millennium one till 1820s. And I think all of us, we are familiar today, uh, unjust medicine's uh, great amount of data is available today. And uh, uh, 1820s, till 1820s, India and China, there were the agrarian economy, world mode of production was uh, uh, you know uh, agriculture and as long as the mode of production of the world was agriculture india and china being the largest uh, you know countries uh, along the river basins that rose from tibet they became the civilizational core and they had the highest number of population and they had the large number of peasants farmers they cultivated more, so they produced more. India at one point was producing 33% of world's GDP and China and India put together close to 60% of world economy, world GDP, they produced two countries and they produced uh, nearly 60% of world economy. These two countries alone. 1820s, you know, this is all medicines, uh, uh, unjust medicines uh, data are clearly you know, available these days, so one can look at it. 1820s onwards, British colonial uh, you know, imposition you know, intensifies in India and that's where the new uh, you know, uh, beginning happens. So as long as the world economy was agrarian, India and China they were the forefront of productivity, how were we conducting our foreign policy? We were trading to with, uh, East Africa, West Asia, Southeast Asia up to China and all that. Also we were going up to North Africa and Italy and Europe spice trade to many of these things if we look at it we had a great uh, you know trade uh, driven connectivity with most of these countries and the trade only carried prosperity it didn't carry war chola dynasty in south if you look at it both the navy wise and the political influence wise they had critical influence in southeast asia and, and, and so on 
And if we look at, uh, you know, mostly Indian historians have missed out uh, this part of it. When Vasco da Gama came to India, you know, in fact, he came to uh, to Kenya and to Gujarati, you know, uh, shipping, uh, you know, pilots, they were trading in that area. They were familiar with the, with the waters and all that. They piloted Vasco da Gama's vessels to Calicut. History has not recorded the Gujarati pilots, those who piloted Vasco da Gama, but history, world history records, because uh, mostly it is written by the Westerns and we are consuming it still. And Vasco da Gama is claimed to be the discoverer of uh, sea route to India and all that. So how was the whole uh, atmosphere? I think Professor Chatterjee put it as a uh, cosmopolitanian uh, approach. I would uh, join with him in saying that India had a great cosmopolitan orientation uh, till, till this time. Then comes the second phase of it, and uh, that's from 1820s onwards. British arrival, it created uh, you know, both a territorial consciousness, created the state as a phenomena of territory, and also it had both uh, you know, it uh, influenced uh, poverty, you know, huge taxation, and, uh, you know, and then cultural and intellectual manipulation of the India civilizational value order and all that, and that's what I think uh, if we look at it, you know, it has been a distortion of India's uh, orientation value system or what has been projected of India, you know, international system, it's largely through the British, British narratives and all that. But in spite of that, continuing with the cosmopolitan character of the civilizational value order of India, if we look at it, both the First World War and Second World War, India participated, more than 2 million Indian soldiers participated in both the wars in great parts of the world and food grains, millions of tons of food grains also were supported to the war uh, uh, no, initiative of the British and we thought that the British will be kind and they will uh, grant India independence. So, but that's what didn't happen, India finally, you know. So that's the second phase where British uh, impact on India and its orientation, that's the second phase. I come to third phase that begins with uh, 1947 onwards. And 1947 onwards when we look at it, how was the whole world order? So that uh, is divided into bipolarity, uh, roughly about 100 countries in the world. But today, if you look at it, we have 193 countries. That means more than 90 countries have been added to the political geography of the, of the world. And that's where India is trying to negotiate itself in the emergence of new states and all of that. And uh, Nehru begins his, uh, you know, Nehruvian model, I think, is a very popular uh, model. But more than Nehru's uh, foreign policy you know, uh, to China or many other countries or uh, even uh, Bandung Conference and all of that, I would appreciate the non-aligned approach that Nehru initiated. So there was a fundamental uh, you know, you know, character of India that he continued. And if I remember correctly that uh, Nehru in 1925, he was uh, holidaying in Switzerland and uh, 1925, he was holidaying in Switzerland and uh, witness the Swiss uh, neutrality of the from the European countries, and that's where ignited his imagination that if at all India can remain remain neutral, and and I think uh, it was a great uh, statesmanship on his part to lead the country in, uh, into a theme of equidistance from both the poles of the world, and we became a non-aligned leader that subsequently also also converges into what we call the South-South cooperation and many other uh, orders of that. What we followed in terms of economy, uh, we followed the ISI model, import substitution and industrialization, and we also followed, followed Arthur Lewis' uh, dual sector model, where we emphasized on agriculture, and we also emphasized on building on the modern industry, steel plants and all of that that we, we talked about. Now, that's the third phase. Now, fourth phase, if I, if I come to, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's uh, foreign policy, phenomena. I keep it as a separate uh, you know, uh, chapter itself for uh, three reasons. One is that Bangladesh uh, campaign. I think uh, Professor Cherezi also talked about strategic auto autonomy. And uh, in the context of uh, maintaining India or uh, remaining away from the, from the bipolarity, India had a you know, non-aligned uh, approach and all that. But it has always remained civilizationally you know, uh, value-added and cosmopolitan in character and Bangladesh of course uh, has immediate impact on India's uh, political system processes and sociology itself. So Mrs. Gandhi decisively participated in the Bangladesh campaign 
and uh, if i remember correctly an of uh, nixon government uh, that time was coordinating with china to create uh, the opening for china to join the uh, united nations and uh, henry kissinger he arrived in delhi in one of his secret missions uh, on his way to beijing and he wanted to have a word with uh, mrs gandhi and we were just away uh, not days away from bangladesh war and uh, mrs gandhi was to have breakfast with uh, henry kissinger henry kissinger uh, the previous evening uh, she telephoned personally to sam manexa saying that join me for breakfast with full military uniform and the military man uh, and uh, she said also okay, this is an order so manexa as a soldier uh, came next day morning for breakfast but wondering that uh, man is calling me for breakfast prime minister is calling me for breakfast but with full military uniform what is the what's the the uh, issue about and uh, on the breakfast table sam manexa realized that the third man in the breakfast table was henry kissinger and he had precisely come to persuade mrs gandhi not to intervene in bangladesh and one narrative in that goes mrs gandhi the person who was serving the breakfast the waiter mrs gandhi asked him in hindi saying ki kitna der isko jalna padega you know in a sense mrs gandhi had decided that we will maintain this strategic autonomy come whatever we are intervening that's where i think i think uh, not only india has been cosmopolitan in character value guided by the civilizational order and and so on but it has also always had the core intention and desire to maintain its strategic autonomy and independence in the foreign policy approaches and all that that's where bangladesh is a prominent uh, you know strategic autonomy phase for india then the nuclearization program of india and the south south cooperation these are all you know uh, teams all of them are uh, characterizing the whole this is on this uh, separate chapter uh, of india's foreign policy and its handling fifth phase 1991 onwards 1991 onwards uh, if we look at it you now we are incrementally we opened up to world economy economic globalization and, and uh, so on and we had you know uh, largely uh, now we also had a nuclear test also second uh, 1998 uh, nuclear test and economic liberalization and then a lot of scientific development through 80s and 90s also has happened like institutions like isro that we are achieving uh, milestones in the space research it is part of this uh, this phase of the the narrative itself but it is largely what happened that's also the time when we are getting into more and more pakistan driven uh, what you call the terrorism uh, proxy war phenomena and all that and how india as a foreign policy mechanism instrument responded to that is in the form of what i would largely call it as a defensive offense that we wanted to just uh, you know preserve ourselves not being very aggressive we just responded to the to the whole phenomena that's what is fifth phase of uh, sixth phase the final phase that we come is that now how where are we standing or how are we conducting ourselves in terms of the foreign policy if we look at that now clearly we have moved uh, we continue to have the strategic autonomy as an idea as a normative uh, proposition we also have moved out uh, from the limitations of defensive offense to offensive defense ajit doval keeps talking about it clearly people are no more feeling sigh about it uh, prime minister modi also talked about that india does have nuclear weapons not for diwali purpose but also not for diwali purpose he remains silent there but that means a clear intent that if at all it comes to that we will apply we may also be forced to apply that also we have uh, no more uh, limitations of no first use i know nobody has talked about clearly but i think we are uh, we are uh, by intent we are also you know uh, trying to imagine that in the maritime sector particularly in the indo pacific uh, front what we are trying to do is that we are part of the international uh, you know strategic coalition uh, quad quad plus iora uh, indian ocean dream association and number of that means we are in a comfortable zone of uh, international coalition that will possibly safeguard india's national interest and, and so on in the economic space how are we doing it today is that we are uh, you know with uh, g77 that's what i would call it as the as the global uh, trade union economic uh, trade union we are also with the uh, g20 
that's what you call the macro managers of the uh, the global economy we're also part of that g7 we are uh, very close to that and then india is seriously considered in g7 and all that so we are from the the core economic club of the world to the macro economic management of the world to the trade union uh, you know uh, protestations and uh, all of that that part of the narrative also we are very much there in addition to that if we look at the institutional involvement of india i think in great part of the i mean very rarely you know any country is individually involved in so many countries be it uh, brics uh, ipsa sarc uh, shanghai cooperation uh, uh, you know china driven uh, asia uh, infrastructure investment bank and all of that if you, if you look at it I, i think we are a major player in the institutional uh, you know paradigm of the of the times uh, today so we are greatly greatly visible so how are we conducting ourselves in this state of visibility how are we conducting itself that's what the my final argument that's the sixth phase of the contemporary phase is that we are uh, doing it in uh, rather uh, two broad ways one is that that we have by uh, now india has a great wealth of uh, soft power and uh, soft power means in you know, a statistically if you look at it 15 million mobile telephones get sold in india every month and now 15 million uh, uh, sri lanka's population is 20 million so we merely buy the similar number of uh, you know uh, uh, mobile telephones it's such a great uh, market for the whole uh, world everybody would like to be part of that uh, that uh, market uh, to have a, a share of it bollywood for that matter bollywood has done a wonderful job in battling india's values systems traditions songs and uh, many things and more interestingly if you look at it 2012 13 tata group tata group they emerged as the single largest private sector employers in the in in britain british uh, britishers they came to india colonized and remained here for 250 years as a colonial power now tatas have gone back to europe to the british uh, homeland and they are the largest employers to the british people which is facing a very miserable economic uh, in our times today indian restaurants for that matter if you look at it they are also a very large employers in uk and not only large employers if you put their shipping sector coal and steel sector and textile sector put together indian restaurants employ much more than all these critical sectors put together so uh that's where uh, you know i see that uh, india has from the millennium one to till now it has continued to maintain a civilizational continuity dialogue in spite of the diversity challenges poverty and colonization all of that we have continued to continue to manage ourselves with the distinction with autonomy with the value system order and uh, you know the civilizational character continues to guide us uh, in our future uh, endeavors and uh, future engagements and all that so that's where when i come to the last portion of the title of the the, the webinar that has india lost our foreign policy i wouldn't uh, you know agree to say that uh, india has lost our foreign policy i would rather uh, you know you know feel uh, you know uh, comfortable say that uh, india's time has arrived the critical time where india will be a peace axis of the world negotiating between the the largest stakeholder of peace in the world today is india the americans wouldn't uh, like peace they would like to intervene they would like to dominate the chinese would like to have their sphere of influence india yes it has a sphere of influence but it is civilizational in, in character it is uh, soft in nature and in practice non uh, dominating as process strategy talked about and so i would uh, rather call uh, india as a peace peace axis for the future times and the amount of goodwill capital india has that's that's the biggest uh, strength india has our single largest limitation is that the, the size of our foreign policy establishment is one of the minimal uh, in the in the world order it's a large country widely it has emerged but the size of india's foreign policy we have hardly 123 uh, diplomatic establishments employing around 750 people compared to china's 20000 people they are negotiating china's national interest so we have to expand the size of our diplomatic uh, network so that i think the the the, the sub power of india the image relational value of india or the peace axis oriented of, of, 
of India can far well be handled into or carried to the international community. And that's where I rest my argument. Uh, uh, thank you very much.